uh, Danny Nong Church of Christ. It's lovely to be with you this morning and uh, to be a part of your service, uh, recognising that we still are living in these strange times. And uh, so uh, I bring you greetings uh, on the screen and uh, via uh, digital kind of technology. Um, this morning, what we're going to do is uh, I'd like to lead you in a reflection on the word. Um, I've called it Light in the Community. And uh, I'm going to uh, offer some reflections around uh, a passage out of 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, a passage that is perhaps familiar to you, and uh, I trust that this will be an encouragement. There are really two thoughts that have been sort of buzzing in my mind around uh, this particular passage this morning. Uh, the first is uh, to be thinking about what does it mean to be uh, the people of God who are communicators and livers of the story of grace, uh, how we communicate light to those around us. And then uh, the second thought is uh, to think a little bit around what that might mean in the context of COVID, uh, and particularly as we come towards the end of the lockdown. And if you're anything like me, probably feeling a little tired, probably feeling uh, a little um, weary at this point. Uh, one person, I think, named this really helpfully, which we'll talk a little bit later, where we, we may not feel like we're quite at the flourishing end of a spectrum or perhaps not at a depressive end of a spectrum, but perhaps somewhere in between that we might refer to as languishing. Anyway, more about that as we travel through. Uh, the other thing about this morning's uh, message is that I'm going to have a couple of spots where I'm going to stop. Uh, I've created three pit stops, and the idea is that you might want to pause the recording at this point. Uh, you may want to take note of the questions that I'm asking and then just do some work after that, uh, thinking through what your response to those particular questions might be. So hopefully it creates a little bit of conversation, a little bit of dialogue and some space for reflection and for uh, perhaps some meditation as well. So let's uh, let's move on. The the passage that I'd like to look at this morning is this very familiar passage, I suspect, from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, a couple of things just to work, that are worth keeping in mind around uh, the book of uh, 1 Peter. So this is written by Peter, um, the apostle. Uh, yep, you got it. Uh, so this is the guy who denied Jesus three times. Um, this is uh, the Peter who uh, was reinstated by Jesus asked whether he loved him three times. Uh, this is Peter who had uh, the food coming down from heaven in Acts chapter uh, 15, uh, 10, rather, um, in terms of uh, the, the food that was prohibited by God and God invites him to eat and three times. So we might refer to him as three times Peter, if you like. Um, but Peter is actually writing to the Christians of his day who are actually exiles. They're a part of a dispersed community. And it is this dispersed community that uh, is experiencing some real challenges under the Roman Empire that Peter is writing to encourage them. And so uh, in amongst a whole range of things that he says in 1 Peter, from just reminding them of their calling, uh, that they are connected by the cornerstone Jesus, that they are the living blocks of God's temple, uh, that they are priests before God, all of those lovely reminders of what it means to be uh, the people of God, the privilege of what it means to belong. It's to this community, this dispersed community that Peter writes. And so he says this, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you would suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but was made alive in the spirit. It's the verse in red that I would like to give uh, some attention to this morning. And my hope is that it will be both practical and helpful. It just strikes me as interesting that Peter is actually saying to this group of people who are dispersed, who are living uh, life uh, 
under difficult circumstances, challenging circumstances, that he says to them, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give a reason for the hope that you have. I don't know about you, but uh, certainly uh, over the last 18 months, uh, the question of hope and looking forward and being optimistic, I think, has taken a few knocks and challenges, has it not? Um, curiously, last night I was on a phone call with a friend uh, who I hadn't spoken to for quite some time. Uh, they were in New South Wales doing some work and uh, they've just come back to Victoria. And, uh, and all I got was a grizzle and a grumble, um, a complaint, uh, a, a sense of frustration. And uh, but I couldn't help but think, what what is the hope that you have? And then later in the conversation, uh, they were able to reflect and say, well, we were actually able to do a little bit of travel. We were able to experience life in a different location. We're now back with family and friends where they live in regional Victoria. And so it took some time for the conversation to reorient itself around uh, being hopeful about being uh, what what it means to be kind of oriented and the posture of of leaning of leaning forward. If I think back to my time as a local church pastor, um, the the idea of uh, giving an account of the hope that is within you, what we might refer to as witnessing, uh, is often something that uh, would be a challenge for me. Uh, I'm naturally not. Uh, I wouldn't classify myself as a natural evangelist. I am someone who speaks about my faith. I do share about that. I give testimony to that. And so one of the things that I've had to sort of work through as a Christian and uh, as, a, as a local church pastor, and even now in my role with CCVT, is working out what are the ways in which we can help each other live out this call of being witnesses in, in terms of word and life, the things that we say and the things that we do. It's interesting to me that um, Peter is the one who is actually inviting us to be the, a part of that community of faith that actually gives account of the hope that's within us. As I said earlier, this is Peter who denied Jesus. This is Peter who had to be asked three times whether he loved Jesus. This is Peter who had three times the voice of God saying, it's okay, you can eat this food, which was actually uh, a metaphor and a story and uh, a reminder that God's family is actually wide and large and that he had the opportunity to bring people towards that living awareness of who and what and how God works in their lives. The other thing that I think that strikes me around the invitation to witness, and this is something that I learned uh, certainly in my last church where I was pastoring, was that uh, my conviction now is that witnessing the the capacity to actually share your faith story is a bit like a muscle that needs to be exercised and it needs to be strengthened. Uh, we had the opportunity to be on holidays in August uh, this time round. It wasn't a staycation. We happened to be in rural Victoria uh, at the beginning b before the lockdown came. And uh, we were there when the lockdown was called and the place where we stayed, they were quite happy to have us for a little while longer, which was terrific. Um, I brought my bike with me and um, I hadn't ridden much over uh, the winter. And so my commitment was to ride every day. And in the uh, weeks that we were there, um, I think I clocked up just under a thousand kilometres, which was just terrific. Uh, and I felt much fitter and uh, healthier for it. And since then, uh, have been continuing on in that sort of regime of exercise every morning. But what I've been reminded of is that uh, if, we, if we exercise, our muscles get stronger, our capacity increases. And I think what's true in the physical is also true in the spiritual. And so when it comes to witnessing, one of those challenges is actually around how do we develop and uh, create strength in uh, the, the, the muscle of uh, faith sharing and doing that in a way that is good and helpful. So as a way of just getting ourselves started in this particular, uh, with this particular thought, we're going to go to our first pit stop. And so in this pit stop, what I'd like to do is to ask you this question, to think about a story of something that has impacted your walk with Christ. 
It may have been something that's taken place over the COVID period, maybe um, an act of generosity from someone else, uh, a phone call uh, at a time when you were perhaps feeling a bit low, uh, perhaps the gift of work that has enabled you to keep on moving and living and uh, having something to do and, and just having food on the table and not having the stress of that. Uh, maybe it's uh, the connection with family uh, through technology. It could be all sorts of things. And what I'd like you to do is just ask yourself this question. What is the story and how has it impacted your spiritual journey? So just for a moment, if you want to press pause, press pause, uh, ask yourself that question or take note of that, and we'll build on this when we come back. <clears throat> Welcome back. If you think about what makes for a good faith story, so your faith story that you were just talking about or thinking about, uh, maybe you're sharing it with people who you're watching this screen with or your family, or uh, you might be in conversation with other people. I'd like to invite you into a second pit stop now and to ask you, if you think about what makes a good faith story, what makes a good description, uh, an illustration, an explanation of your journey with God, what might be some of the components that fit in with that? I don't know about you, but um, every now and then I, I, I hear a faith story and one of the things I discover is that it's full of Christianese, like the language is just um, sort of hyper-biblical, if you like. It's, uh, it's all the big eight-cylinder words and, uh, and I think, oh my, if you were sharing that with someone who maybe is unfamiliar to the Christian story, what does that actually communicate? Um, sometimes I, I think about uh, the, uh, the posture that a person holds, uh, maybe the intensity with which they speak, uh, a sense that they're maybe really trying to sell something and, and they're into the hard sell. Uh, or maybe they're apologetic. It's like, oh, it's not really all that, imp you know, I don't have too much to say. What is it for you that makes a good faith story? So let's just pause and I'll come back in a moment. Welcome back. So, thinking about those two previous screens, what is the story of your journey? What is the, uh, the event or the circumstance that has impacted you? And then thinking about what actually makes for a good faith story, an effective, compelling story, a story that actually invites people to hear and to listen and engage. What might that look like? Well, I, I think Peter in 1 Peter 3 actually gives us a few clues. And uh, if you like, you might want to think about this as the fine print, uh, the, um, the detail that could actually be uh, helpful for how we build and describe and capture our faith story. Now, just as we do that, one of the things that might be worth thinking about is that uh, the the reason why it can be helpful to think about what our faith story is, is that it's a way of actually capturing how we have discovered uh, God's goodness, uh, God's strength, God's presence. Uh, it can be ways in which we discover for ourselves that uh, our journey is actually one of resilience and hope. Um, it actually reminds us that things of substance have actually taken place that can be real markers of God's goodness and his love and his intervention uh, in our lives. Uh, think of it this way. A number of years ago, um, Philip Yancey, who you may or may not know of, uh, wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. It was a, a lovely um, uh, description and reflection around the journey of um, uh, God's love being kind of woven into um, human life. And, uh, and one of the um, reflections that he made was uh, it's really important for us to follow uh, the green 
a grass of God's activity. Um, we had a, a very um, lively example of this years ago when we uh, were ministering in Devonport. We had a guy who was a farmer, a, a, ca- a dairy farmer. Uh, at one particular point, uh, the, the cows broke through the fence and they were just kind of walking down the side of, of this street in a place called the Nook uh, in um, just behind uh, Devonport uh, in Tasmania. And I can remember saying to Hedder at the time, so like, how does that work? Like, what happens there? And he says, Michael, the cows just follow the grass. And uh, so my sense around this next part of our time together could well be to naturally think about uh, where are the places of green, as Yancey would say, or as my uh, friend <coughs> in Devonport used to say, uh, the cows just follow the grass. So here's an invitation for us to follow a few things. So in 1 Peter 3, uh, Peter says, uh, set yourselves apart. Uh, and essentially he's thinking about what does it mean to be God's person in God's time? We uh, we have some curious reflections, I think, around time. So, uh, you know, we often run by the power of our watch, our time. The Bible has two descriptions for the notion of time. One is chronos time. So that's uh, the time that it is now. Uh, it's the time that we use when we recognize we've got to be in a meeting or in a Zoom or there's things to be done, an appointment uh, for our vaccination or whatever it is. That's chronos time. The other time in the Bible is actually Kairos time. And Kairos time is actually the time of opportunity. And it seems to me that part of the invitation around uh, faith sharing and uh, giving voice to what God is doing in our hearts and lives is actually being open to that Kairos moment. And every now and then, I don't know about you, but I know this is certainly true for me, I have this sense of uh, the nudge or the hunch or the thought that I reckon this might just be an opportunity to uh, reflect something of what it means for us to be uh, living in this time as God's person in God's world. So um, as you prepare, think about setting yourself apart and being open to the nudge or the opportunity to exercise that muscle and to become stronger in it. The second is then to actually be prepared to tell your story and be prepared, be ready, be skilled and have the capacity to do that. One of the things I learnt, uh, if I think back to our time at uh, Hope in the Hills when we were there, was that there were many people within our church who had this very uh, real sense of wanting to be able to share God's story. What I discovered was it wasn't a question of will. It wasn't a question of desire. It was actually a question of competency. And so what we did was we created uh, spaces in our service from time to time. We had times when we gathered as a community and we actually invited people to say, why don't you share with the person next to you or in little buzz groups or um, settings that we kind of constructed to actually give people an opportunity to share their faith story, to be prepared, to actually um, build some both competence and confidence to be able to do that. And then the next thing that Peter says is, you know, set apart God in your heart, be prepared to give an answer actually of your experience of good news. I think people are not interested necessarily in uh, the experience of someone else down the road or someone they don't know. But if we're in conversation with people, what what they want to know is what happens for us, because people love to talk about themselves, don't they? And when the opportunity is there, there's an opportunity for us to actually say, well, here's here's my experience of of God. Uh, It's interesting. Last year, we um, uh, we had a staycation at home in August. Uh, we got caught in that terrible storm that took place. Uh, a tree at the front of our house um, dropped a couple of really large branches. Our house was reasonably damaged. We had a lot of um, uh, work that we needed to do. And uh, and what we discovered was uh, the generosity of neighbours that actually became, for me, 
uh, a story of God's care of uh, people around me who actually represented, if you like, the hands and feet of God. Uh, and so um, for me, part of my faith story, my experience is actually some reflections around uh, how, how God just shows his goodness in unexpected ways and from unexpected people. So give an answer, give an answer to uh, your experience of good news and then uh, give a reason. So you can illustrate the story. You can uh, give it some shape like I just did. Uh, and you might have your own illustration of how you might um, share your story and uh, be prepared to give an account of the hope that is within you. It's not a grizzle. It's not the grumble, although there's a place for that. Um, but we're actually uh, giving a, a broad perspective of uh, the goodness of God in our life. But as we think about what it means to be light people, what do we do when life is a bit tricky? Let me offer you um, a reflection. A little while ago, uh, I came across an article um, from a uh, North American uh, psychologist, actually, um, uh, his name, uh, let me just have a look at that, uh, is a guy called Adam Grant. Um, and he wrote an article, which, said, which uh, the title of which is, There's a Name for the Blah You're Feeling, and it's called Languishing. Now, I think this is really helpful in the context of uh, where, where we're sitting in COVID and certainly from where I'm sitting as a member of the CCV team and we make our phone calls to churches. Uh, this has been a really helpful thought and reflection for us uh, as a movement. Think in terms of a continuum. Uh, at one end of the continuum is the idea that we're flourishing. At the other end of the continuum is what we might see as depression flatness. And in the middle, Brand suggests that there is a space which we would call languishing. And so as we've spoken with, um, as I've spoken with uh, church leaders uh, across our movement, uh, sure, there are certainly some who are saying, I just, you know, this is a bit depressing. Um, but most are not in that space. And then, but neither are people in a space where they would have a sense of being flourishing. But they're actually saying, we're just sitting somewhere in between. And it's in the in-between that we're invited uh, to actually develop um, capacity for resilience and for strength and for forward movement. It might look something like this. Brand suggests that one of the uh, maybe some simple ways in which we can uh, find our way moving towards flourishing is what you're actually seeing on the screen right now. He talks about three things and it's just written in red. Um, the idea of finding flow. In other words, uh, what might be the new challenge, the enjoyable experience, the meaningful work that you can engage in at this period of time that can just help you pitch your way forward. We're doing, um, we've kind of got this ongoing renovation really going on at our house. And um, uh, I must admit, I had a period where I was just feeling a bit sort of in that languishing space. And uh, and so I painted uh, an outside wall. Uh, there was a lovely um, uh, Saturday afternoon, the sun was shining. And uh, didn't really want to, but in the course of that, all of a sudden I found myself doing that and feeling uh, it was like a creative space to be. I quite enjoy painting, actually. But it did make me realise that uh, sometimes developing flow is actually finding our way forward where we can just kind of find the tracks again. And and in the context of God's goodness to us, there may well be um, some some new challenges or enjoyable experiences or meaningful work that is a gift from God that just helps us find our way forward. The other is around um, the gift of uninterrupted time uh, that, that actually is that sense uh, that, that delivers that sense of uh, progress that we're moving towards something. Making a boundaried space in our world. It could be that 
uh, you're spending, you know, every evening in front of the telly watching Netflix. I don't know. I'm not sure what your what your lockdown experience looks like. But what if we were able to uh, create some time that's uninterrupted, that sure might have that sense of just in a kind of um, doing some activity that it's not meaningless or brainless, but just is a bit relaxing. But it could also be that we're finding the uninterrupted time, which is about the reading of a book or a listening to a podcast, a conversation on the phone with someone we love and care for, but that actually just is uninterrupted, that's boundary, that doesn't get uh, kind of impressed from other spaces, and we just are able to move forward. The other thing Brand suggests is developing a small goal, a small win, a manageable challenge, something that uh, we can actually see the end of. I'm a, I'm a bit of a crazy puzzler. And uh, at one particular point I, uh, in lockdown, I was doing puzzles because it was just an enjoyable way of doing something other than watching telly. Uh, we could have conversation together and Joanne was doing what she would do and I would do what I was doing, doing the puzzle. Uh, but I, I have a puzzle at home, which is a 3000 piece uh, sort of 17th century world map thing. And uh, was, I was going to do it again and it was just too big. I have to say, I, I I waved the white flag. And so I just went back to some smaller puzzles again because it was just that sense of, oh, too much, too much. It may well be that there is something around a small goal, um, a small achievement that you would want to, that, that actually um, gives you a sense of momentum and movement. Let's take this thought, languishing, and how we move towards flourishing and build our next pit stop. If someone were to say to you about, uh, if someone asked you to say something about your journey with God and how you have made sense of COVID and how you remain hoped filled, what would you say? What would be your story? What is your story of having that posture that allows you to be uh, forward oriented, that allows you to be in that space of um, moving towards flourishing, if you're not there, acknowledging perhaps the languishing and building resilience for the sake of um, being healthy in, in this period. So why don't you just take some time uh, as we uh, just sit in this last part of our time together in this pit stop and ask yourself that question around have you made sense of COVID and how you have remained hope filled. And it could be that uh, just going back to that slide around uh, the languishing, that it may be something about the flow that you have found or the boundary that you created around time or the goal that you set for yourself that is just a reminder of um, the opportunities that are there uh, before you. Folks, welcome back to uh, the last part of our um, time together this morning. A number of years ago, I came across a devotional that was written by Roland Croucher. Roland Croucher was, uh, way back when, was the uh, senior pastor at Cross, what is now Crossway Baptist Church. It was Blackburn Baptist Church at the time, Blackburn South. And uh, and in that, he, he offered some reflections around uh, um, what it means to be used by God, what it means to be uh, someone who's able to... Um, communicate the message and uh, to be a, a storyteller, if you like, uh, like or uh, the offer of light in community. He recorded a fable. Uh, I don't know where it came from. I suspect it's pretty old. I'd like to leave that with you as we bring our time to a close uh, this morning. It goes like this. Outside the city in a marsh near the river grew a reed. The, greed li the reed lived in the green and yellow marsh, and all of its life it was happy. And when it rained, the young reed, thank God, felt clean on the outside and on the inside. 
Her life surged and the reed became strong. When the run red sun beat on the march, the reed thanked God then too, but not as loudly as before. The reed knew that although the sun scorched the outside and hurt the inside, the roots were digging deep into rich black soil. But most of the days were just like yours and mine. They were sunny, overcast, windy, or drizzly. One day, I'm not sure of the date, the Son of God walked through the march, marsh. He liked it out there at times, away from the Whirlpool City, and there the speckled reed, uh, he saw the speckled reed and stopped to look at the reed. It wasn't that the reed was particularly beautiful, but the Son of God needed a reed to pipe on as a flute, and with a little fixing up, this reed would do. He studied the reed and finally said, Little reed, I need a pipe to play a melody. Would you let me use you? I can fix you up for my purpose and it may hurt, but I wish to sing a song of love and grace through you. Well, the little reed could hardly believe its ears. It could hardly believe what was happening or what the Son of God was actually saying. Finally, the reed, strangely enough, said, Yes, let it be done. And the Son of God took the reed out of the ground, and it did hurt. The reed lay in his hand and didn't mind. And even when he took his knife and cut away the roots, the reed trusted his work. Yes, let it be done, the reed said. The Son of God whittle, whittled the reed to fit his palm and emptied the clutter from its heart. And when the reed was hollow, the Son of God took the reed to his lips and uttered through her a beautiful song of love. I just have this sense that part of the opportunity of this season is that we are the people who the Son of God wishes to utter his story of grace and goodness as we are prepared to tell our story to those around us so that we might be light to our community. Friends, as you go from uh, this service this morning, uh, my prayer is that you will be encouraged in terms of some just practical hints and clues around developing and sharing your own faith story. And my hope is that you would be encouraged in terms of uh, the journey through COVID, perhaps in a state of languishing, to be able to move towards flourishing and to then use that story, not just for your own purposes, but where others might also be encouraged to see the goodness and the grace of God. So go with peace, go with love and go with strength. La, 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 la.